hello everyone and thank you for joining us this afternoon for the second event in the University of Virginia's 2022 Alumni Effect Virtual Speaker Series. My name is uh, Claire Carter and my pronouns are she and they, and I'm an associate professor with the Department of Gender, Religion and Critical Studies. And over the next hour, you'll hear from alum Jack Brasseur, a fantastic and dedicated community advocate and leader, as well as a graduate of the University of Virginia. But before I introduce Jack, I'd like to acknowledge that the University of Regina is situated on the territories of the Nehewak, Anishinaabek, Dakota, Lakota, and Nakota, and the homeland of the Métis Michif Nation. The University of Regina is on Treaty 4 lands with a presence in Treaty 6. Land acknowledgements are a starting place within our ongoing work for recognizing and redefining systemic and institutional practices of relating between Indigenous peoples and settlers. They are about our relationships to place, space, and power, about commitments that have been broken and continue to cause violence. And they are part of work that involves learning about and supporting peoples and nations upon whose land we live and work and making a commitment to unlearn colonial patterns and to learn new practices and ways of being in relation with each other to foster more just and respectful relationships. The University of Virginia's alumni relations team is pleased to offer the Alumni Effect Speaker Series virtually. This is my first time hosting a lecture in this series, and I hope that your time with us today demonstrates some of the incredible ways members of the U of R community are active and engaged and committed to social change, which inspires your own actions, including joining us at future sessions. I should point out that these sessions are being recorded and will be posted on the U of R alumni website so you can watch presentations again or share them with friends and colleagues. You'll see the link to the alumni website in the chat if you'd like to access the video later. And now it's my great pleasure to introduce our second speaker in the University of Regina's 2022 Alumni Effect Virtual Speaker Series, Jack Brasseur. We're glad you're joining us. So Jack is an alum of many faculties in the University of Regina. They earned their Bachelor of Social Work in 2015 and their Master of Education in 2021. They have served as the National Director for Fierte, Canada Pride, and are currently the CEO and Primary Consultant with Ivy and Dean Consulting. Today, Jack will discuss their journey working in the 2S LGBTQ IAP plus community and their experiences working with youth focused uh, nonprofit organizations. Jack is a warm, generous, extremely hardworking and dedicated activist, former student, community leader and overall human. I've had the great fortune of working alongside Jack in several capacities when they were a student as the executive director of UR Pride Center for Sexual sexuality and gender diversity, and more recently with Ivy and Dean Consulting around municipal activism. Following their presentation, we have about 15 minutes for a question and answer session. As you listen to Jack's presentation, please submit any questions you have in the chat feature, which you'll find at the bottom of your screen. Also to let you know that there's live transcripts available, you can click um, the link on the bottom of your screen as well, and you can message me if you have any questions in the chat. I will share uh, questions with Jack after our presentation ends, and we will do our best to get as, to as many of the questions uh, as time allows. So I now turn the Zoom room over to Jack or Sir. Thanks, Claire, so much. That was such a lovely introduction. <laughs> uh, and uh, I, I feel similar warmth from you, and I'm so, I'm so grateful to be able to share space with you, uh, both on campus when I was there uh, and now off campus in community. Um, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to share my screen here. Um, I'm hopeful that folks can see it. Um, Claire, if you want to give me a thumbs up that you can see that you can see it. Perfect. Um, so I'm so happy uh, to be joining you folks. Um, I have, uh, the U of R has a, has a soft spot in my heart. Uh, and, uh, and I'm so grateful um, that, uh, that, that um, alumni, that the alumni office invited me to participate in this speaker series. Um, I'm proud to, to also be continually involved uh, in the U of R uh, in my role uh, as a board member on the University of Regina Alumni Association. So um, like Claire has shared, my name is Jack Brosser. Uh, I graduated uh, from the University of Regina um, in, uh, well, you heard in 2015 and 2021 um, with, uh, from the social work faculty uh, and then later on in the education faculty. Um, I'm also a proud graduate of Aurora College, which is a small college in Northern Canada in Yellowknife uh, and Fort Smith. Um, and uh, my pronouns are they, them. Um, 
And I, yeah, I'm really, really happy to be here, particularly in celebration, uh, in celebration of Pride Month. Um, and sort of before I jump in a little bit too much, this is this is a photo of the Pride Crosswalk in Sambique, Denende, uh, Yellowknife, Northwest Territories, um, uh, that has a warm place in my heart. It's right by City Hall in Yellowknife, and it's a lovely crosswalk that is there all year round. Um, and I also just want to um, offer uh, an acknowledgement of, uh, of the place that I'm tuning in from right now, which is on Chief Draghi's territory um, in Den and Day. Um, and I think, you know, as a, as a white settler who grew up in Northern Canada, um, it's really important to me to pay respect to the place that I came from um, and to, to make note of my own connection to land and my own connection to place. And one of the ways that I do that, uh, as well as um, sort of working, trying my best to work in solidarity with Indigenous communities, particularly Northern Indigenous communities, is trying to raise awareness about, uh, about the ways that uh, the ways that Northern Indigenous people are being significantly impacted by a wide range of issues in our community, including uh, climate change. And so if folks aren't aware, um, there's been some really devastating flooding across Southern Northwest Territories um, this spring. Um, and if folks are interested in, um, in supporting uh, in supporting that cause and, and helping uh, rebuild Northern communities, um, that I'm going to put a link here in the chat uh, to just a space where you can um, where you can donate some funds to mm -hmm. the local United Way, uh, which works directly with uh, with which works directly with Indigenous governments um, and communities across the North uh, in response to the flooding. So um, I encourage folks to take a look at that and learn a little bit more about the ways that climate change are significantly impacting Indigenous communities, both in Northern Canada as well as across uh, Saskatchewan. And and the world. Um, and so, uh, as I said, happy Pride. Uh, I think a lot of people think about June as Pride Month uh, because of the origin of the Stonewall Riots. Uh, if you're not familiar, the Stonewall Riots were, um, were a, a series of, uh, of, of, of actions in opposition to, uh, to, state, uh, to state policing of LGBTQ people in New York City in the 70s. Um, and following Stonewall, um, uh, Brenda Howard, who's often discussed as the mother of pride in 1970, hosted uh, the first the first anniversary march uh, to commemorate the Stonewall riots. And ever since then, this is why we continue to, to celebrate pride in June. Um, Queen City Pride just hosted their, their festival recently in Regina, um, which I was unfortunately unable to make. Um, but I also want to pay respect to Yellowknife, which is where I currently am and where I spend a lot of my time, um, who celebrates Pride Month in August every year. And so, um, and, and I also want to, um, you know, as I, as I mentioned earlier about just like relationship to place and, and paying homage to that, I want to recognize the history of Yellowknife, uh, of Yellowknife's LGBTQ community, um, which is a lot different than those of like the Stonewall riots in New York City. Um, I want to pay respect to those involved with a great organization uh, that was active in the early 2000s called Out North. Uh, with which dissolved in 2006, but really the folks involved in Out North, uh, who I could name, uh, but uh, I'm thoughtful of, of outing and confidentiality. Um, so many of those people paved the way for me to exist and work in the field that I worked in for so long. Um, and I just want to pay respect to those people. Um, Yellowknife, uh, according to a census a couple of years ago, um, not the most recent census, but a couple of years ago, Yellowknife and Whitehorse have the highest number of, of women in same gender relationships than any other place across the country, uh, per capita, I should say, I guess, because their population is quite small. But um, that's always been a point of pride for me in that Yellowknife is a very queer place. Um, and so I'm so I'm grateful to be from there uh, and and to have grown there uh, and learned so much of, of what I have there. Um, so I, I want to start by just uh, as as Claire said, I, I'm going to talk a little bit about my journey uh, as a student uh, at the U of R as well as someone who works who's worked in the LGBTQ community sector for over a decade. 
Um, and so here are, this is, this here is a photo. The first photo there uh, is um, in my, uh, my first college class at Aurora College in Yellowknife. My child wear, in one of my first classes, my child welfare class. It's my child welfare textbook there in the background. Um, this was the first time, I mean, growing up in Yellowknife, everybody knows you, it's a tiny community. And my, uh, this was the first time in my life that I actually wrote my name the way that I use it today in a public space and asked people to call me that. Um, and that for me was such an instrumental part of who I am today. Um, and so this is an image of that uh, with a couple of little drawings that I drew on my name tag. Um, and, uh, and that would have been back in 2011. Um, and, and then the, the photo on the, on the other side is my, my first res ID when I moved into residence at the U of R, uh, in 2013. Um, and the thing about, uh, making that choice to live in residence, you know, I, when I graduated high school, I was sort of one of those kids who like breezed through without having to do any level of work, which, uh, is, is really not good, especially when you're a teacher, when your parents are long-term educators um, uh, and who are also alumni of the University of Regina. Um, and, uh, and so, but I decided to stay in Yellowknife for a couple of years to go to local college here because I was convinced that I would just totally flunk out of university because I had never really had to study very hard before. Um, and so I took some time at Aurora College to, to learn how to navigate uh, university uh, and post-secondary settings. But then when I moved to the University of Regina, um, by that point, I was in my third year of school um, and I decided to live in residence because growing up in Yellowknife, we didn't really have uh, the, you know, I only ever saw like university on TV and like this idea of like what that was. And I was like, I want to live in residence. I want to have fun. I want to meet people. Um, but moving into residence uh, when you're a number of years older than most of the people who live in residence um, was really interesting. But I uh, I moved into College West before that beautiful renovation. Um, and, uh, and I lived in a seven people apartment um, with a group of really great folks, uh, some of whom I'm still friends with. Um, but that was my first sort of foray into the UVAR was just like living on campus. Uh, I ate a lot at the salad bar downstairs in Riddell. Um, I, I purchased a lot of potato chips from the convenience store at the in Riddell. Um, and uh, and I yeah, I really, really loved living on campus. It was there was a lot of really good memories there. And as I said, I really as I, I was not a good student in high school. And I don't know that it improved that much in my bachelor's degree, but, you know, I regularly missed class often because they were too early. Um, and while I would often get really good marks on the things I did submit, um, I did find myself getting a lot of B's and C's in my classes because of my tendencies my tendency to procrastinate often by choosing to do activism and community work instead of school. And I would just like miss deadlines. And Claire knows I've told this story before to Claire, but I, I took my, one of my first semesters of school. I was lucky to take a class with Claire. Um, and I probably, it was like, in my head, it was like a 730 class. It was not, it was, it was, it was like an 11 AM class. But in my, in my heart, in my memories, I remember it being very early. Um, and I, I missed class probably like three or four times in a row. Um, and Claire found me in, in the hallway one day and just and like gave me, which I feel like was very manipulative, was just like, <laughs> was, you know, Jack, are you okay? We haven't seen you in a little bit. I just, you know, I, I, I'm really worried about you. I hope that you're doing okay. And I was just like, yes, I'm fine. I've just been busy. <laughs> um, and then she said what she had said to me multiple times since then, that uh, people just learn so much better, Jack, when you're there. And if only you could be with us, that would just be so great. Um, and so I look back on that memory with Claire and uh, with laughter. <laughs> um, but I think uh, I was lucky to have 
Um, I think for me, one of the things that was really special for me at the U of R was the number of queer and trans faculty that I was able to build relationships with uh, and learn from. And for the first time in my life, um, I was learning about queer and trans academics and study, you know, queer and trans studies from queer and trans people instead of just like on the internet on my own. Um, and that was so special to me. Um, and I really, uh, I really appreciate the work that different faculties um, have been doing at the U of R to, to more purposefully hire uh, and seek out faculty members uh, with queer and trans backgrounds and, and, and knowledge. Um, and I think that that has such a big difference to the lives of queer and trans students uh, at the university. Um, and, and so I just, I feel so, I feel so blessed, uh, as I said earlier, to, to get to share a space with Claire, but it was really important to me for the first time to, to be in a space uh, at the U of R, uh, where I was around um, people who could teach me about my community, which wasn't really something that I had the opportunity to do in Yellowknife. Um, and so after I finished university, uh, I moved back. Well, I tried desperately to stay in Regina to be with my partner, but then I ran out of money. So I had to move back home. Uh, I couldn't find a job. So I had to move back home to Yellowknife where I just jumped right back into the work that I was doing. And so um, I'm, I'm proud to have been one of the co-founders of uh, what is now known as the Northern Mosaic Network, um, or at the time was known as the Rainbow Coalition of Yellowknife, which was the first uh, ever to us LGBTQ youth organization in any of the three territories across Canada. Um, and the photo there in the, the top corner um, is the photo of um, our opening of the first ever youth center designed devoted to LGBTQ youth in, uh, in the Northern Territories. Since then, I am uh, queer Yukon has opened up a, a center in the Yukon and Folks in Ihaluit in Nunavut are working diligently to, to develop a space on their own as well. Um, and what sort of nice little kismet is that I'm actually in the building today presenting from because the internet at my house is so bad. So I'm in the building today where that rainbow center still stands um, sharing with you today. Um, and the other photo there is a photo of me and, and a, a friend and mentee of mine who was actively involved um, in, uh, in building uh, the Rainbow Coalition or the Northern Mosaic Network as it is today. And I'm so proud of that young person who's in that photo with me because they were also, um, he was also really instrumental in starting the first ever um, LGBTQ student group uh, at a Catholic school in the Northwest Territories. Um, and so, I, I came back to Yellowknife. I started jumping right back into community work. And for a really long time, I didn't get paid. I paid the bills, waitressing and serving because uh, nonprofits, especially when you're founding one, doesn't often pay the bills. And I remember at one point, my mother actually had to say to me, Jack, you need to stop volunteering and actually find a way to make a living. And I told her, I said, mom, one day I swear I'm going to be able to get paid to do this work. Um, you just need to stay with me. And eventually I was able to start getting paid to do LGBTQ community work, uh, which I feel blessed to have been able to do. Um, but at this point, you know, I was, I had my social work education, but I really hadn't met any queer and trans social workers. Um, I was lucky to be able to take a number of electives at the U of R that allowed me to meet queer and trans faculty members and adults uh, and professionals in my community. Uh, but unfortunately, I didn't know any queer and trans social workers. And at that point, I was because I didn't get to focus a lot on queer and trans. Um, I didn't get to learn a lot about queer and trans social work at the U of R. Um, I was convinced that there weren't really queer social workers. I didn't know that they existed, uh, which feels like such a silly thing to say now that most of my network is made up of queer and trans social workers. Um, but it wasn't really until 2018 when I attended the Social Work and Sexualities International Conference in Montreal, when I realized that I could be a queer social worker. But unfortunately at that point it was too late. I was already like deeply in love <laughs> with my work in queer and trans communities. Um, and, but, but I, I, that conference allowed me to really start deeply thinking about social work through a queer perspective, um, asking like, what does a queer social work ethic look like? 
but also can I exist as both queer and a social worker? I think a lot of queer cultural practices um, are sometimes in opposition to uh, the social work code of ethics. Um, when we look at the ways in which um, uh, there, you know, there's very separate roles and there's not tons of, tons of sort of challenging as much as you might think there would be of like challenging power dynamics in a social worker client relationship. And so, um, I spent a lot of time really trying to think of a lot about that. Um, and I was lucky to, uh, I became a registered social worker in the province of Saskatchewan. Um, when I was in my role as executive director of the rainbow or of, uh, of the UR pride center. Um, and, but then I discovered, a love of community education. And so um, I found a love of teaching workshops about LGBTQ communities and helping people understand the, the vastness and beauty and joy of queer and trans communities. Um, and a lot of this uh, came from my love of queer and trans theory, uh, which if you've been to anything else I've ever presented, you know that it's a lot of what I talk about. Um, but it also just came with seeing the immense changes in community, uh, in, the, in the communities that I was a part of in Yellowknife, but also in Regina, when I was able to help people understand um, understand the LGBTQ community, definitely, but even more so um, to understand, understand their own identities and to understand sexual and gender identity is so much more than only something that LGBTQ people get to experience and find joy and understanding in. Um, and it was because of this love of community education that I decided to pursue my master's in education. Um, and, uh, and this was actually really great because I discovered in my master's of education that most people who took master's of education courses were teachers, which meant that they had to schedule all the classes at night which was absolutely perfect for me because it meant that I showed up uh, and, and I succeeded. But I also think that um, it was often, it was also difficult. Um, I remember an experience I had in an early childhood education class uh, when I was focusing on um, LGBTQ curriculum where I had to witness my peers say just really terrible things about to us LGBTQ people and whether or not uh, me and my identity is age appropriate for children. Um, and that was really hard for me to hear because I was an LGBTQ child. I knew that there was something different about the way that I wanted to love others and the way that I wanted to express myself um, when I was really young. And to hear this group of, of, of current and, and future educators um, completely dismiss the reality uh, and the very real presence of 2S LGBTQ children was just like devastating for me. But I was also really lucky um, at that time when I was doing my master's at the U of R um, to still be in my role as, as executive director of the Pride Center of UR Pride, which was both a campus organization and a community organization. Um, and through this time, um, here's a photo of, of me with Ralph Goodale uh, opening up our uh, first downtown, um, the, first the first location for UR Pride off campus. Um, and I am so proud of the work that I did at UR Pride with a wide range of people, um, people like Kat Haynes and Emmy Rittenberg um, and, uh, and a number of really phenomenal board members and staff uh, like Andrew Bay, um, who uh, accomplished so much when we were there. Um, I'm so proud of, we were able to open up um, colorful campus housing in partnership with the University of Regina to create an LGBTQ uh, specific uh, dorms for students who were interested in building and, and developing LGBTQ community living on campus. We were, uh, we were able to, uh, to start Monarch Mental Health, which was a mental health counseling program for LGBTQ people in Southern Saskatchewan, which unfortunately had to close recently due to a lack of funding. And we also opened uh, this location in this photo, which is called Space, um, which was meant to create a space in downtown Regina that LGBTQ children children uh, and kids could make their own in community. And I absolutely loved working in the LGBTQ sector. I did it for a really long time in Yellowknife, 
in, in Saskatchewan. And then I was lucky to leave your pride to accept an interim role with Fierte Canada Pride, which is the National Association of Prides. Um, and doing that helped me learn, I mean, throughout all of this, I learned so much about the wide range of LGBTQ organizations um, and sectors that exist across the country. And I want to talk a little bit about those, because I think that a lot of folks who maybe aren't, don't have their finger on the pulse of like what's happening amongst LGBTQ communities, don't really realize just how extensive this network of organizations are. So we have social service organizations that are devoted to LGBTQ communities. Those are organizations like You Are Pride or Out Saskatoon. Um, we also have uh, health organizations. Those are organizations like uh, like AIDS program of Southern Saskatchewan um, or uh, the CBRC, which is the community-based research center. Um, there's tons of different organizations that devote themselves to studying and advocating um, and supporting LGBTQ health. Um, there's also really great arts organizations such as Queer City Cinema, which is a, which is a queer film festival in Regina. Um, there's, also, there's also tons of other arts organizations across the country. There are queer choirs, there are LGBTQ LGBTQ liter literary organizations like Lambda Literary, which awards the, La the Lambda Literary Award every year. There's tons of really great arts organizations who focus on LGBTQ communities. We also have campus organizations, which UR Pride was also one of those. We also have uh, if you're if you're familiar with the University of Saskatchewan, they also have their USSU Pride Center, which is the Student Unions Pride Center. Um, and campus organizations work closely with community organizations, with LGBTQ community organizations, to improve realities for LGBTQ students and sometimes faculty on their campuses. Um, but at the U of R, we're really lucky to also have a faculty organization, uh, which is the University of Regina Queer Initiative, um, which was founded a number of years ago and recently has seen a resurgence, which is so exciting. Um, and then we also have pride organizations, which are those festival, the, the, the festivals that pay homage to the origin of pride, which is where, which is Stonewall riots. Um, and we also have legal organizations that specifically work to to, to eliminate barriers to access to justice for LGBTQ people. Um, probably the most famous organization is Lambda Legal, which is a, which is a United States-based organization that supports LGBTQ people in, um, in challenging human rights breaches. Um, but we also have a really great uh, legal organization in Canada called Justice Trans, which is all, which is all about supporting trans people's um, access to justice in our country. Um, we also have advocacy organizations. Those are organizations like Gal Canada or the Enchanté Network which is a federation of LGBTQ organizations who specifically work on advocating for a safer, uh, more inclusive country, um, and in some places, provinces and territories um, to, to, to support LGBTQ human rights. And finally, we have industry organizations. Those are organizations like the CGLCC, which is the LGBTQ Chamber of Commerce in Canada, or organizations like Pride at Work, uh, which is a which is a, a workplace um, justice, which is a workplace safety organization devoted to creating more inclusive workplaces for LGBTQ people. But we also have a lot of industry associations such as um, like like queer professional associations, such as uh, there's a really great um, like group for LGBT lawyers, for instance, or doctors or teachers, all those kinds of things. So, and I and I don't share this to just be like look at all of the different stuff that LGBT folks are doing, but more so uh, because learning about all of these different organizations really taught me a lot about the importance of collaboration and working together. And the unfortunate reality is that there's never enough funding for LGBTQ organizations. Um, Saskatchewan, for instance, is one of the few places, is one of the few provinces that doesn't have fund, that doesn't directly fund, um, at least significantly, or provide core funding to LGBTQ organizations in the province. Um, but yeah, so there's never any enough money, but still all of these organizations, despite this like scarcity mindset, still end up collaborating together uh, to, to, to challenge and, and encourage people to create more inclusive spaces for LGBTQ people. Um, and so some things that I've learned about while working in this sector, the first one is that I have been so lucky to be able to be my authentic self at work every day of my adult life. That isn't the reality for most people. Um, and I also learned that mainstream organizations don't have the understanding they need to be serving our communities, to be serving LGBT communities. A lot of people ask me, like, why do we need a health organization, an arts organization? Like, why can't 
other organizations be serving LGBTQ communities? And what I've noticed is that the capacity and the knowledge base and the understanding just isn't there. Um, and the unique cultural realities of LGBTQ people often aren't recognized um, by a lot of those organizations. Um, and, uh, and also that collaboration is really the only way to get things done. Uh, you need to be able to collaborate with folks, um, but uh, doing work that is so personal is really, really exhausting uh, and tiring. Um, and I sometimes wish that uh, I hadn't done it for so long because it was so, it was, it involved so much burnout. Um, and the last thing I learned was really that queer and trans communities are not a monolith. Um, I learned so much about worldviews that aren't my own, but that are shared by other LGBTQ people in this work. And I feel grateful for that. Um, uh, and so some of the things now, as I've started, uh, I've started my own business last year, some of the things that I've sort of brought from that sector and from my time at the university uh, is around asking myself questions, like how can I care for my community and all the work that I do? What does it mean to create space where others can also bring their whole selves to work? Um, how can I make sure that I'm learning and growing even when I'm teaching others? Um, and finally, are there others challenging me when I'm wrong or perpetuating harm? Um, and, and so I'm, I'm grateful to, to the University of Regina who awarded me um, an alumni award uh, a couple of years ago. And, and in that, I spent a lot of time thinking about how have I grown since university? And one of the things I noticed is that in university, I slept in way too much. <laughs> um, but I did push back a lot. Uh, I think if my apologies to those who work in the, in the university communications department, because there were many uh, angry tweets. Um, and, uh, but I also demanded justice on campus. I demanded that I was treated and other LGBTQ people were treated with respect and dignity. And now throughout my career, um, I definitely still sleep in too much. Um, my, my work schedule is generally, uh, I work, I work way past five o'clock. Um, but I also ask others to push back against me uh, and I demand a commitment to justice from all of those that I work with um, and uh, in creating inclusive spaces, not only for 2S LGBTQ people, but for all folks in our community. Um, and so that's a little bit about me and my journey through the university. Um, I know I went over time, so we don't have tons of time for questions. No, did I? I didn't. Nice. Okay, perfect. Right on time then. Uh, perfect. But uh, if you wanted to get in touch with me, here's a little bit about how you can connect with me uh, and take a look at some of the work that I do. Um, I also encourage you to find me on LinkedIn uh, and let me know that, uh, let me know if you wanted to connect that way. Um, and thank you so much to the university for having me today. Um, and I hope, I wish everybody a really, really happy Pride uh, and a happy uh, Indigenous History Month as well. Thank you so much, Jack. Um, that was really lovely having known you um, for a number of years to learn so much uh, more in addition to what kind of, yeah, I, I've had the opportunity to, to know about you working with you in different capacities, but it was really lovely to kind of hear you talk about, uh, yeah, those years and the connections uh, and, and where you are now. And that some things don't change, but that, that's, but that's okay. Some things definitely, some things definitely <laughs> don't change. <laughs> And you were actually early, five minutes early. So well, you had time. There we go. Perfect. So we've got more time for questions. So if there, um, if there are any. Yeah, I really encourage people to, uh, yeah, share some questions uh, in the chat. Um, if you have some questions and, and maybe while people are starting to think, I'm going to, you know, be an annoying former prof of yours and like ask you a question. Um, so you started off in social work and then you moved to education. And I think what, uh, nerds like us like to hear about are what are some of the connections between those two different disciplines, two different faculties um, that inform the work that you do now? Yeah, that's a really great question. I think, um, I mean, obviously the similarities uh, for me, you know, when I was, when I was, I, I'm the child of educators. And when I was growing up, I saw um, I wanted to be a teacher. I saw the, the really big impact that my parents had on the kids that they taught. Um, and um, most of that impact I saw after hours. Um, my parents, you know, we regularly had kids eating at our house who didn't have food at home. We often, my dad would drive, you know, would pick up a bunch of kids on our way to school to get them to school. Um, and so I wanted to be a teacher because I wanted to help kids. 
Um, and then I realized that you actually can help kids without having to mark things. Um, and so then, <laughs> so I made the decision to, to try social work. And while I really enjoyed so much of what I learned, I also really struggled with, you know, the origin of social work comes from um, the state trying to enforce a status quo in the family um, and trying to enforce sort of um, really restrictive and often homophobic and sexist and racist laws in the family. Um, and so, and then I think especially in the North, the history of social workers um, and their, their, their impact on um, the high number of, you know, on the 60 scoop and the high number of Indigenous children in care. I really, as I learned more about that, I really struggled with the idea to, um, to stay in that field and to be complicit in a system that I think is really harmful. Um, and so I decided to go into education um, not surprise, surprise to work in institutions like schools, which I think are also, which also have a really complex history, but instead, because I wanted to learn how to more effectively teach. Um, and I think that for me, the connections, there's definitely a lot of overlap in terms of the theories that we're pulling from. Um, anti-oppressive education and anti-oppressive social work are very similar. Um, you know, um, uh, Friere's like pedagogy of the oppressed is very relevant in social work settings as well. Um, uh, and so the, I think that there's a lot of connections there, but, um, and then obviously like, you know, figuring out how to navigate institutions, um, is also a similarity. Um, yeah. So I, I think that those are a lot of the similarities and, and I, I definitely bring my social work practice and background into the education I work that I do and vice versa. Um, and, and I think that I'm lucky to have, to have been a part of both of those faculties. Thank you. Um, I have a question from Alexis McEwen. It says, thank you so much, Jack. My question is what initially drew you to the University of Regina coming from Yellowknife? Why did you choose to finish your degree here? Yeah, that's a, that's a really great question. I wish that I had something more interesting to say, except other than um, Aurora College actually did their certificate of social work program in partnership with the University of Regina before that program uh, fit, was finished. But um, I ended up picking to stay at Aurora College because my family is originally from Saskatchewan. So my dad grew up in Outlook and my mom grew up in North Battleford. And so I would spend the summers every year in Regina and Saskatchewan. Um, and the idea of moving to a big city, which like people often laugh at me. Like I had a lot of international friends when I was in university uh, from like India and China. And I'd be like, oh, I moved to a big city. And they would just like laugh at me because Regina is the last thing from a big city. Um, but for me, I was so worried about going to like metropolitan Canada that the most common university that people go to from Yellowknife is the University of Alberta. And I was just like not interested in going to like a huge concrete jungle in Edmonton. Um, and so I wanted to find a university that was small enough that I wouldn't feel overwhelmed, um, but that still had enough opportunities for me to, to build relationships and community. Um, and so in some ways I sort of ended up, um, I wasn't really sure after high school what I wanted to do, but I thought it was such a good fit that Aurora College had a relationship with the University of Regina because it meant that um, I could take some courses at Aurora College, and when I finished that, I could transfer directly to the U of R. So it ended up uh, it ended up working really well. And I'm um, I'm I I think had you told me when I moved to uni to the University of Regina to go to school that I would have stayed in Regina after I graduated, I would have told you that you were just like off the wall. Um, but uh, I really feel like Regina is my home now. And I think a big part of that has to do with my, um, with the people and relationships that I have built at the university. Awesome, thank you. There's also a comment in the chat I wanna share from Ramona Clark. And just again, thanking you for your uh, commitment to educating others. And that Ramona said, I first heard a presentation at the U of R Pride location off campus, and it was so well done and our family learned so much. So thank you, Jack, for continuing on your path it made a difference to our lives. Oh, thank you so much, Ramona. That's so lovely to hear. I love hearing about, about the way that folks have, have been able to continue supporting their family and loved ones um, because of what they've learned. Um, and there are so many incredible educators across the province, though. So don't stop at my stuff. Please 
go out and seek out all the education you can from such a wide range of incredible educators and community members um, across the province. So, but thank you so much, Ramona. And also, uh, Panin from Nadine, thank you, Jack, great presentation and thank you for sharing. And from Cynthia, Jack, thank you so much for sharing your stories, passions and education connections. Um, so lots of uh, expressions of gratitude and thanks uh, in the chat. And I, I think we have a couple more minutes. I'm gonna give a chance if there's any other uh, questions people have or comments people would like to share, please take this opportunity to, yeah, either raise your Zoom hand or pop them in the chat. Cynthia. And start my video. Hi there, Jack. I want to thank you so much. I'm a grad of the University of Regina, <clears throat> twice over at, uh, with a master's in arts education and then master's. Um, when I saw your presentation in my little alumni email, I knew I had to come and listen and hear you and see you. I presently live in a very small town in rural British Columbia, Kimberley, uh, four hours from Spokane, Washington, and four hours from Calgary. So, but I am, I do also sit on the board of directors for an international women educators organization. We're in 17 countries, uh, DKG Society International, and we'd love to hear you from you. And so I'm thinking, wow, I'm gonna be, con I'm glad, thanks for your slide. I've got your contact information. Um, we have, we're across Canada, and, all of the US, of course, and, in, and then we're in 15 other countries. So Latin America, Japan, and Europe. So I think you'd be a great speaker, uh, probably start. And I'm a member of Alberta State Organization because I'm closest to their, you know, distance wise. Mm -hmm. So um, we are always looking for speakers and uh, I'm going to be contacting you. Well, so. thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, that's, that's such thank lovely. Uh, that's such a lovely uh, review, I guess. I don't know, an, an mm. opportunity. I would love to hear from you and um, especially from, from a fellow alum. So thank you so much. <laughs> well, I'm a mother of a gay man and uh, of, of two gay men now, mother-in-law and <laughs> mother, mother and mother-in-law. And uh, when I went for to his birth for to his wedding, I had two staff members who, when I left Regina to go fly to Toronto for that beautiful weekend celebration, I had two staff members: one a very new teacher, and one a very seasoned educator, who both asked me the question about whether whether people could do that. <laughs> right. So yeah. it was just yeah, it was really cool. So I had a student in my class whose mothers. Um, I'd met and became, you know, connected to through their son. And he told me all about their wedding and how wonderful it was. And he told me, you're going to love it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, queer people, we know how to throw a good party. So that's, that's definitely, that's definitely true. Yeah. That's so lovely to hear. Yeah. 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 My son's a teacher in Toronto, actually a high school uh, awesome. chemist, chemistry teacher. So yeah, it's all good. Awesome. Good educate. Lots well, thanks of educators. again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much um, to everybody who's here. Um, oh, Mark, Mark, Mark shared a, shared a comment here. Uh, have you found an employer, or do you have any ideas about how uh, about or know how this can be built into a workday? I'm sure you're not alone. Yeah, I am. Um, I have been lucky to be my own boss for most of my life. Um, before that, I worked at movie theaters and I worked at restaurants. And, and so I ended up finding spaces. But I think, you know, one of the things about um, doing work uh, in a world that is so connected is that um, people can be productive in so many different ways. And this idea that productivity has to happen uh, before noon uh, in order to be legitimate, <laughs> I re I've always really struggled with. I think um, one of the things that I found really helpful in some of the teams that I've managed is just saying, you know, that we have a flexible start time um, and folks are able to start any time, but that they have we have to be working together during a specific time. So, you know, we're always, all of us have to work from this time to this time, but outside of that, you're able, you know, sort of having flex hours. And I've, I found that that's really helpful. Um, but I also think, um, I think that the opportunities 
for organizations to recognize the value of having employees who are interested and willing to work past your, you know, sort of past your regular time. Um, I think about those families, you know, those parents who would, I'm sure would much rather, you know, finish work when their kids are done school. And if you have other staff who would much rather work into the evenings, that opens up so much about, um, the, the way that folks that you serve in whatever work you do um, have more access. And so I think about the traditional nine to five office time when all that's all the work that gets done. And well, if I wanna call anybody after six o'clock, everything's closed. But if instead we recognize the fact, you know, the, the possibilities of people who maybe are, who like to, who sleep schedule, you know, who are sort of night owls, um, I think that it would also just increase, um, increase the, the, the level of availability to, to the general public too. So, um, but I've, I've definitely really, I think my first, my second practicum when I was did, when I did my social work degree was as a medical social worker in the hospital, at the hospital in Yellowknife. And my work day was 7 a.m. to 3 p.m. And it was just like, it was the, I, it was terrible. Uh, I could do it, but it was it was just not for me. And I quickly learned it wasn't for me. Uh, and since then, and lucky, I'm lucky now that Ivy and Dean, my consulting practice works mostly with volunteer led organizations, which means that most of them are at work, you know, during the day anyways. And so they can't meet with me until, until the evenings. So it all worked out. Uh, but definitely it's been a big, I've sort of, ex I've stopped trying to hide the fact that I sleep in. Um, but I like to say that I sleep the same amount of hours as everybody else. It's just, different. I, 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 I work, you know, I, I, I'm working until midnight or one o'clock in the morning. And then I, I just sort of moving my schedule. So, um, yeah, but <laughs> I don't know if that helps. Maybe it does, or maybe you've just learned a little bit more about, about my sleep habits. <laughs> and I know there was a few more comments for you to, to check out there. Um, Jack, again, more expressions of, of gratitude. Um, so I also want to say thank you, everyone, for joining us today and contributing to the conversation. And thank you, Jack, so much for sharing your time and experiences with us. Um, it was a great privilege for me to get to, to facilitate this conversation. And also let you know that a video recording of today's Alumni Effect Speaker Series will be posted soon on the alumni section of the website. A link to the website, again, can be found in the chat. Um, and so don't forget to check out the University of Regina Alumni Events website for more information on upcoming series. Our next Alumni FX speaker will be on July 19th, 2022, and features Katie Svensson, who has been featured on the BBC during the Olympics for her research on women's uniforms in sports. I know that I will be <laughs> tuning in for that one. So thank you so much, everyone. Uh, thank you so much, Jack. Uh, and thank you to the Alumni Office for inviting me to facilitate. Take good care, everyone, and, and have a good rest of your day. Thank you so much, Claire, for being such a lovely facilitator and just a cheerleader for me. Thank you so much. <laughs> Endlessly, Jack, always.